Hello everyone, my name is Hassan Shaquille. I'm one of the Health Education England Genomics Education Programme uh, Development Leads and it is my immense, immense pleasure today to introduce a talk by one of my very close friends and he has been since the start of medical school for me, Dr James Patterson. James um, was with me at Cambridge, then he went to UCL to do his MBPhD with Sir Paul Ness, and he's going to talk to us today about his work with CRISPR therapeutics. So, without any further delay, James, you have the floor. Let me just get the presentation shared. Um, but thank you everyone for coming today. Today I'm going to be talking to you about um, CRISPR technologies, CRISPR therapeutics, and giving us a broad introduction to CRISPR. Slide in my disclosures. Um, so, an overview of this talk today. Um, today, I'll talk to be talking to you about gene editing and CRISPR and giving you a sort of a brief historical context on the development of this exciting technology before going into a bit of an in depth review into how the Cas9 gene editing system works, which is really the prototypical CRISPR system. I'll then uh, run through some alternate Cas systems and their potential use cases. Uh, talk to you about novel ways of functionalizing CRISPR enzymes to enable uh, novel therapeutics, give you an overview of the CRISPR therapeutics landscape, and then chat briefly about some key challenges based on, based on CRISPR's use in the clinic and some ethical considerations as well. So to start off with, um, CRISPR. So CRISPR really is an amazing breakthrough, um, which uh, two scientists, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dudner, uh, received the Nobel Prize. And really, I'd say gene editing is the holy grail of gene medicines because it allows you to correct endogenous genes rather than inserting additional copies, which was really the topic of the majority of my talk uh, last, last linkage webinar. Um, and CRISPR has really increased the use and efficiency of gene editing versus prior methods. So, and these original methods included meganucleases, zinc finger nucleases, and tile effective nucleases. And what's really exciting to me is that they show the value of, of investing in research into fundamental science. Um, so this work is all derived from work into the bacterial immune system, and now it's having such a massive impact on the therapeutic space. So just to put um, CRISPR into the context of the history of genome editing, um, because genome editing started long before CRISPR, um, and really it started off in the 1970s, 1980s, um, with the uh, demonstration that you could perform gene replacement in yeast. So I started even before that in bacteria in 1958, there was a Nobel Prize for homologous recombination in bacteria. Um, but really, um, it progressed throughout the 1980s and sort of came to, to, came to front in the early 2000s with the expansion of zinc finger nucleases. And these have been used in therapeutics by a company called Sangama. And I'll go into them briefly as well. In the late 2000s, um, tile effective nucleases came onto the stage and kind of, sort of a brief moment, I'd say, before CRISPR came about. And these were sort of much easier to program than DNA sequence specificity than zinc finger nucleases for targeting specific genes. Um, and then, really, in 2012 is when CRISPR broke onto the scene. Um, CRISPR has been around also since the 1980s uh, when it was first identified as weird sort of repeat stretches in bacterial DNA. Um, it's only in the thousands when, when a lot of work by Emmanuel Charpentier uh, went into understanding what these repeat sequences were and the process of, of or their importance for bacterial immunity to bacteriophage infection was discovered and then this quickly progressed into a realization that this CRISPR tool could be used for site-specific genome editing and all these advancements are really resulting in CRISPR therapeutics starting to make their way into the clinic so um, at present, and this is this slide is uh, sort of a year old now, uh, all this, this data here, but um, there's 31 CRISPR trials progressing through the clinic. And as far as strips some of the earlier technologies, so you can see Talon's seven, uh, seven trials, zinc fingers, five trials, and this is in ex vivo gene editing. So anyone who came to my previous talk will know this is where you edit cells outside the body and put them back into the patient. Um, far less trials ongoing in vivo gene editing um, for all modalities, and this is really a result of the delivery issues that uh, we touched upon last time as well. Um, but really today, CRISPR is the tool of choice for therapeutic gene editing approaches, and this is because of its high efficiency. 
it's um, the relative simplicity of targeting with it, its small size, so its ability to fit into various delivery vehicles and get into cells. And um, this has really made a major impact. So today, 63% of gene editing trials utilize CRISPR as a tool of choice. Um, I keep talking about gene editing, but what really is gene editing at its core? Um, and gene editing is the modification of endogenous genome sequences through site-specific manipulation of DNA repair pathways. And this is something that I think uh, I'd like you to take away from this talk is that any gene editing or um, any gene editing approach, whether it's zinc fingers, talons, or CRISPR, is really just a way of manipulating your cell into correcting DNA damage in a way that results in it incorporating a novel nucleotide or correcting some sort of DNA sequence um, and, and returning it to its sort of wild type X state or whatever user defined state you want it to be. Um, if you want to integrate novel repaired sequences, you need to introduce a DNA template. So that's an additional component. Um, and this can then be incorporated through homologous recombination. There's some other exciting approaches called, for instance, prime editing that I'll run through briefly as well. Site specific DNA breaks in the absence of template DNA result in random insertion deletions due to the repair pathways you've used, which can disrupt gene functions. This is how you can generate a knockout. Um, and CRISPR use cases now really extend beyond this simple gene editing kind of paradigm. So CRISPR's really evolved into something much broader, sort of a platform to target specific bits of DNA and kind of do whatever you want to do when you get there. And there's a range of therapeutic applications that result from that. Um, but just to dive a bit more now into the DNA, how DNA repair pathways are the key mediators of gene editing. So any of the gene editing approaches we talk about, or the classical gene editing approaches, are all about DNA site-specific cutting. So you pick a site where you want to uh, target uh, either gene deletion or you want to target uh, gene introduction. And you need to cut that site specifically. This results in a double strand break, uh, no different from the double strand breaks that you you're about with ionizing radiation or any other mutagens. Um, however, you've introduced this break at one specific location. This double strand break has two fates to be corrected in a cell. It's neither being corrected through a mechanism called non homologous end joining, which is low fidelity and can result in insertion deletions and therefore gene disruption. Or if you have a template which potentially has a new novel piece of DNA that you want to insert, so here highlighted, for instance, in red, um, this templated region can then be inserted into your uh, into the genome at the site at which you've cut, dictated by the homologous lines that are either side of your, of your gene of interest that you're trying to introduce. So just going into a bit more detail now on how non-homologous end joining works. And this really, again, is this it's a low fidelity way that your body uses to fix double strand breaks. So it's error prone because once you cut and create a double strand break, there's a range of enzymes that process the ends that are created and they chew back nucleotides, disrupting the gene sequence. Or they can introduce novel uh, nucleotides into this at the cut site. And then it randomly glues these two ends back together um, with whatever nucleotides have been inserted or deleted. So the end product of just simply cutting or doing a site specific cut with your gene editing tool is a random combination of deletions or insertions that can result in, um, in, in, in gene disruption. And endogenously, really, this is the only use to fix double strand breaks in the G1 phase of the cell cycle classically used then. And that's because you don't have a sister chromatid that you can use as a repair template. So obviously after S phase, you're able to synthesize another copy of your genome. And then this can be used as a template for DNA repair. Um, and that DNA repair mechanism is known as homologous recombination. So Homologous recombination is the DNA repair process that enables high fidelity DNA insertion. So for this type of gene editing, you require both a site specific double strand break. So your gene editor has to cut at a specific locus and a template which will, uh, which features DNA sequences that are homologous to either side of your cut. So for instance, here you have your template uh, 
uh, the thing my mouse is showing up and hovering above this, but you can see there's a left homology on um, with a specific change that comes after this. And then there is a five prime, or sorry, three prime or right homology on. And this is homologous, i.e. the DNA sequence is the same as the uh, DNA sequence in the genome immediately after your cut site. And um, what the cell will do is recognize this homology and then fold those arms into the genome, introducing them, and then it sort of gets tricked introducing whatever site-specific change you have in them. So this is important for integrating genes into the genome or integrating um, particular modifications that you think the cell should have, so for fixing things in a very high fidelity manner. Um, so what both these mechanisms have in common is the fact that you need to introduce a site-specific double strand break. So the first approaches to doing this uh, I mentioned earlier was the zinc finger nuclease. So I want to just take you through the history here so that you can understand why CRISPR is so important. So it's important to, to look back at really what we were what we were using or what other people were using uh, back in the early 2000s. Um, so zinc finger nucleus is really the original site-specific DNA modification enzyme. And it's a two-component system where zinc finger proteins are made of modular domains. So you can see here the P1, P2, P3, and P4 domain um, highlighted in the left the zinc finger protein. These domains are evolved to bind to specific three-letter code. And when you chain these together, you get increasing specificity of binding. So P1, for instance, binds to the GTT, P2 binds to GTA, P3 to CTG, and P4 to CTC. Uh, and this gives you your actual full specificity of where you bind your zinc finger protein. And you can modify these P1, P2, P3, P4 domains so that they have different sequence specificity. Um, on the end of these proteins, you have a uh, nuclease, which only works if you have two copies uh, bound within a certain uh, range of each other. So again, you can increase the stringency of your cutting by having an additional zinc finger nuclease, which binds upstream of the left zinc finger protein, and then you reconstitute a functional cutting enzyme, so a double strand break inducing enzyme between the two. And this allows you to get a site-specific double strand break. So zinc finger nucleases were originally popular, but just very difficult to engineer because as you can imagine redesigning a protein to bind to specific three-letter uh, three uh, DNA codes is quite timely. It's all, it was very hard to do, so it didn't really take off in sort of popular research use. Um, talent systems came next, and these are tal affected nucleases, actually derived from bacteria that infects plants, again, I think demonstrating the importance of fundamental research. And so these are also proteins that bind to specific bits of DNA, and they work through the same sort of modular concept of chaining, um, chaining protein domains together that recognize particular nucleotides within the DNA. And here we can see, again, a, 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 a talon, and each individual domain now has a specific two amino acid difference, which dictates its ability to bind either A, T, G, or C. So by chaining together a range of these proteins with different amino acids at these X marked positions, you're able to generate the specificity of binding to a particular DNA sequence in the genome. Um, again, these work through reconstitution of a uh, DNA cutting enzyme, uh, FOC1, which only cleaves when two copies are present um, in close vicinity, and that's driven by having an additional talent that binds uh, upstream to the first one. So again, while this is easier to program than a zinc finger nuclease, these talent proteins are extremely large, so very difficult to deliver. Um, they're also clunky in the sense that you have to have two enzymes, uh, two proteins present and bind uh, to achieve uh, cutting. And so when CRISPR came along very, very rapidly after the talent sort of started to gain ground, um, CRISPR-Cas9 system shown here, it was really revolutionary. Um, so what are the constituents of the CRISPR system? So the CRISPR or Cas9 system, as hinted here, features uh, a Cas9 protein, 
that Cas9 is this protein highlighted by a sort of beigey oval. Um, and it also features um, an RNA component called single guide RNA, or a, a synthetic guide RNA. Now, um, the Cas9 itself features endogenous nuclease activity, so there's no need for the FOC1 nuclease that was present in both the talon and zinc finger nucleases. And specificity of binding to DNA is dictated by your SG RNA sequence. Um, anyone who's at the uh, previous lecture knows that um, complementary base pairing is an important concept, for instance, for siRNA therapeutics. And this effectively works in the same way. There's a region of your guide RNA that is complementary to the region of the genome you want to cleave. Um, upon binding to that region um, in the context of Cas9, um, the guide RNA, the Cas9, and the DNA stimulates cutting through two nucleus domains present in the Cas9 enzyme. Um, and this is what allows you to achieve double strand breaks with Cas9. So, so you can see this is a much simpler system to program because there's no need to do protein engineering. One can simply synthesize guide RNAs with particular nucleotide sequences that exactly match up with your genome target sequence to achieve site-specific DNA cleavage within, within the human genome. So when did this CRISPR-Cas9 system come from? Um, so CRISPR systems are really the bac uh, bacterial immune system. And um, the way they work is that a, uh, a virus might infect a bacteria, so shown up here at the top, so a bacteriophage, and will inject its DNA into the bacteria. This DNA can then be randomly incorporated into, um, into the bacterial genome in regions that feature these clustered regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats, CRISPR. Um, when these regions are inserted, so you can see here that the viral gene in blue has been inserted in the context of the um, black DNA, which is the, um, the, the bacterial genome. You generate a, uh, you can generate a transcript which features um, viral DNA interspersed with repeated um, bacterial gene DNA. This is transcribed as a long RNA featuring both viral uh, genes and also uh, bacterial genes, which is then processed, releasing um, small RNAs that feature viral RNA. So now we're at region C, um, that feature viral RNA, a component of the bacterial RNA, and um, they bind to another RNA called the tracker RNA. This is just a free floating constant RNA that has complementarity to the black region of, of, of RNA that's present in this bacteriophage plus bacterial um, CR RNA. And it gets a bit confusing with the number of different RNAs here to keep track of, but I promise it will get simpler on the next slide um, when people figure out how to uh, fuse these into one single RNA. Now, the importance of this is that you've effectively generated a, an enzyme that is now specific to bacteriophage DNA. So that means that when your bacteriophage comes back and infects this bacterial cell, you have a Cas9 bound to RNA that directs it to cutting that bacteriophage DNA. So now when bacteriophage infects, its genome gets chopped up and it's unable to infect the bacterial cell. So by randomly integrating bacteriophage in DNA into the bacterial DNA, the bacteria is able to establish long-term memory of infection and protect itself from future infections of, by the same bacteriophage. So this two RNA system that requires both the bacteriophage um, RNA and this um, constant tracker RNA um, is, is slightly too complex to be used in a sort of efficient therapeutic context. We want to have one RNA, one protein, and we don't want to have to worry about mixing together the tracker RNA, some other element of RNA, and then forming a functional tripartite complex. Um, so work was done to kind of fuse these two RNAs together. And this is really a seminal, seminal paper out of the Doudna and Charpentier labs. Um, and what they did 
was they looked at how uh, the CR RNA, so this is the RNA with the uh, the sequence complementary to target DNA and a bit of constant region, and the track RNA, which is the RNA that binds that constant region of, of the CR RNA, and they fuse them together with a small hairpin loop sequence of G and three A's. This produces a single guide RNA, or a synthetic guide RNA. And what they showed is that this RNA is able to direct Cas9 to cleave uh, particular plasmids, shown on this uh, gel block here. Um, I thought because it's such a seminal paper, it's worth showing the, uh, the actual figure. It has now been cited around 15,500 times. They're able to show cutting. So, for instance, here, this is the situation with just Cas9, this first lane, um, and no RNA. You can see the plasmid is fully intact. When they add in a CR RNA, again, remember this is the RNA containing a bit of a constant region and gene specific region, and the track R RNA, they see cleavage. And when they add in their Chimera A RNA with a full length tracker region, um, they see cleavage of their plasma. Um, so, this is really the paper which, um, aside from all of the other work, but I think this is the key paper that. that, that uh, contributed to their, their, their Nobel Prize. Um, so how do we use CRISPR in practice? There's two components here now. There's a single guide RNA, which features a target specific region that you can program. And there's a Cas9 protein. These are the two important components. So when you're in the lab and you want to knock out a gene, what do you do? How do you go about doing this? So first off, you have to identify your target gene. So what gene are you going to knock out? Um, and then you can use online tools to identify guides. So it's a range of online tools now that you'll paste in the target sequence you want to hit, and they throw up a range of different guide RNA or, or potential target sequences that you can go after. And what's really useful about these is they, they look for potential off-target sites. So we're talking here about a, so many 20 nucleotide target sites. Your genome is billions of nucleotides long, long. There's a chance that those 20 nucleotides come up again, and you don't want that because you want to introduce one site specific double strand break. Um, what this program will do is hunt for anywhere that uh, this site comes up again and tell you. It also now gives you some prediction of the efficiency of cutting because obviously you want to put this in and see most of your cells have cut in them. Uh, or double strand break. And so once you've done this design, you uh, go online shopping basically. You can copy the guide RNA sequence that you want to order into an online uh, web store and order that guide RNA. And then you can also buy separately uh, like the Cas9 protein. So these are as purified components. Um, once you receive your, your, your Cas9 and your guide RNA, you mix them together in a tube. And then you have to deliver this into your cell population. So you'll have your cells growing, um, maybe they're hematopoietic stem cells and you're about to uh, knock, out, uh, knock out a particular gene within them, maybe they're T cells. But you'll effectively mix together those cells and one way of getting the CRISPR complex then into those cells is through electrophoration, which again I touched on in the last talk. So this literally zaps your cells and, and forces the CRISPR complex into them, into the nucleus where it gains access to DNA and can perform cutting. You then allow your cells to recover and you can harvest your DNA from these cells and check for editing by sequencing. So people often use Sanger sequencing, you receive a trace, um, you also perform a control sequence where you sequence the same region but it hasn't been exposed to CRISPR. And then you look for cutting. So here, for instance, you can see that um, we've chopped out um, a T and a, uh, we've chopped out a T and a C, resulting in a two base pair deletion in the majority of the cells by looking at the same sequencing trace in this particular uh, genome editing experiment. Um, one thing to highlight is that this, uh, this, this deletion would have been caused by non-homologous end joining because we didn't introduce a repair template. So we're relying on the cell's endogenous repair mechanisms to erroneously correct the double strand break you've introduced and introduce some sort of small insertion or deletion at that site. 
Um, so really, DNA repair is, the, is doing most of the work after you've introduced your double strand break. Um, so what do you do next? You have a population of cells that feature uh, feature some sort of uh, modification that's been introduced into them through a double strand break, and now you want to use them. So um, you have your pool, which has uh, has knockouts with the net. And again, if you were doing this experiment on primary T cells, trying to engineer a T cell therapeutic, you might be engineering natural killer cells as a therapeutic, or you might be engineering um, CD34 hematopoietic stem cells. Um, in these cell types, you really need high efficiency of knockout in your pool because you can't take single ones of those cells and grow them up. You have to deliver that entire population to your patient. Um, so you determine your knockout frequency through sequencing. And then you can introduce these cells into your patient, assuming that you've achieved a high knockout frequency. However, there are some cell, cell types, and, and um, one that's really exciting are induced pluripotent stem cells. So imagine you have an induced pluripotent stem cell now um, uh, from a patient, um, and you've used CRISPR to knock out, uh, let's say, a dominant, uh, a, a, a dominant uh, genetic mutation that's causing the trouble. Um, and now you have a stem cell that you've made that does no longer feature expression of that, of that protein. You can single cell clone from your pool, your mixed bag of different, um, different modifications in your different cells, isolate a single cell that does have knockouts, i.e. it has a deletion or insertion of a non-multiple of three uh, number of nucleotides, introducing a brain shift, and expand and, and, and differentiate differentiate using the downstream cell type. Um, I just want to highlight here that induced pluripotent stem cells um, really leverage this advantage in being able to do clonal cell isolation and produce um, a defined pure population of cells that all feature whatever knockouts or gene editing modification that you wanted to introduce. Um, so as, as mentioned here, what you would do is take your um, induced pluripotent stem cells, do your precise genetic engineering, um, end up with a human uh, pluripotent cell line that now features your engineered modification. And then the great thing about these is because they're stem cells, you can then differentiate them into whatever downstream cell type you want. So this is a great way of producing ex vivo engineered cell therapies at scale. So people are turning IPS cells into uh, T cells, into NK cells, CD34 cells, as well as using them for more regenerative medicine approaches, uh, making neurons to treat Parkinson's, uh, making uh, cardiomyocytes to potentially treat uh, to treat uh, cardiac damage. Um, some limiting factors, just just to mention about bringing these into into the clinic, is just the safety of the cells. Obviously, they've been engineered; they've had some double strand breaks. Um, they're potentially oncogenic themselves. The differentiation protocols you use to turn them from a stem cell into a functional cell type are all being worked out at the moment. Um, so you really want to make mature, um, high functioning, differentiated cells. And transplantation methods need to be worked out. So in that cardiomyocyte example I gave, it's not immediately obvious how you graft on um, some cardiomyocytes to a, to a damaged heart and then expect them to engraft and, and then correct that damage. So there's a lot of work ongoing in these fields. And really, um, CRISPR technology is being used in, in all of them to produce high functioning differentiating cells. Um, and there really are many use cases of CRISPR, um, even beyond healthcare. So, uh, people are using it to engineer crops to increase nutritional value um, and engineer pest resistance. It's engineered mosquitoes for malaria control, so things like gene drives. Um, uh, there's engineered animal models to improve drug evaluation strategies, making better mouse models so we can get uh, better at predicting whether a drug is going to work before we enter the clinic. Um, and they're really specific to human health and practice. Um, People are generating um, personalized medicine models with, with IPS cells. So again, using these stem cells that come from patients or engineering stem cells from patients. Um, there's massive improvements ongoing in the antibody and biologics manufacturing space. So making cell lines that produce antibodies better and cheaper, potentially expanding patient access to these. Um, 
There's really interesting diagnostics work now using CRISPR to detect specific nucleic acid sequences. And this is actually one of the first COVID tests that was developed was developed by a company called Charlotte Biosciences in the US. Obviously, there's a lot of work ongoing into ex vivo engineered cell therapeutics. And then really the, the, the dream future is in vivo gene editing, being able to do site-specific genetic modifications in patients to fix whatever genetic ailment they might have. Um, so I just want to run, run through why, why this is important in the drug discovery um, system. And here you can imagine that if you have a, a patient with a severe genetic disease and you want to screen for a drug that can help treat that genetic disease, um, you can generate stem cells from that patient, so induced pluripotent stem cells. And it seems a bit counterintuitive here, but you can, you can then turn that, uh, that stem cell normal in a dish. And this creates a controlled cell line. So it's, it's effectively your, your dream case. What would, what would your patient look like if they had a, a normal, uh, normal genotype at the diseased or mutated site? Um, and it gives you, I guess, the upper bar for how, how good your cells can be. And it's the perfect comparison to your diseased or mutated cells. So you can now differentiate these into a desired cell type um, and screen drugs. And you can look to see how much your drugs make your disease cell models look like your fixed cell model. It's a great way to screen for different, um, different compounds that might, might assist these patients. Um, you can also compare the transcriptomes of these different cells and look to see if there's any potential drug targets that you could go after. Um, in cell therapies, um, one particular area that's really sort of heavily under investigation at the moment is engineering um, T cells to target cancers. And um, the key benefit or key thing that CRISPR enables is that it allows you to um, use uh, donor T cells to engineer these, um, these cancer killing T cells. So the first generation of these CAR T cell products are all based on autologous therapeutics, i.e. you harvest T cells from the patient, they get shipped out to a factory somewhere, uh, they get transduced with a, with a virus expressing, um, expressing this chimeric antigen receptor that targets them to a cancer, and then they get reinfused back into the patient. Um, and go off and, and kill the patient's tumor. And um, you can imagine that there's, there's, some, there's some problems around um, a patient might have been through many stages of chemotherapy and their T cells might be a bit knackered um, you, and therefore not, not be as efficient at killing, uh, killing the tumors as, um, as a healthy person's would. Um, additionally, these patients are often really sick and every week counts. And if you have to send away those T cells to, uh, to a processing plant before you can get them back into the patient, that time, that time can be important. So if you have off the shelf access to engineered T cells, that'd be great. The problem is usually healthy donor T cells um, get rejected by the patient. Healthy donor cell T cells can also go on and attack the patient because um, they themselves will recognize antigens in that patient that aren't present in themselves. So what you can do using CRISPR and, uh, for instance, uh, the non-homologous end joining approach is knock out the genes responsible um, for, for that T-cell mediated killing of the patient, so graft versus host disease. And you can also knock out um, markers that the patient's immune system will recognize on these donor T-cells. Um, so you can engineer them to be effectively immune inert or immune silent as possible. And this means that in a hospital, you can have a bank of frozen allogeneic CAR T cells ready to go for the patients and to be infused as quickly as possible. Um, using CRISPR as a drug itself in vivo editing, this touches on quite a lot of what we went through um, last week. The key issue is delivery. How do you get your CRISPR enzyme? To the right place in the, in the patient. We now have to get the CRISPR protein cutting in the right place in the genome, but getting that to the right cell in a patient is very difficult. And people are working on a range of different delivery vehicles, including nanoparticles like the lipid nanoparticle uh, that the COVID vaccine comes in, and different viral vectors. Um, this would be a really revolutionary once we can target these really beyond the liver 
but on demand, once and done therapeutics to restore genes to their wild type functionality. Um, some of the limitations of, of, of CRISPR come into, um, come into targeting specificity. Um, so we said that you have a 20 nucleotide region for which you can, you can direct your, your, your CRISPR enzyme. As mentioned, your genome is really big. There might be regions of the genome that slightly match your target site, so you can get off-target cutting. Um, it's your delivery of CRISPR. Um, Putting, virus, putting RNA into cells that doesn't look particularly natural can trigger immune responses. We spoke about that last time there as well. Um, and there's also some issues around just the toxicity and the immunogenicity of cast proteins. Obviously, they're bacterial proteins recognized as foreign by the immune system. It's not particularly surprising. The benefit of, of, of the cast system, though, is that it needs to act very quickly. Once you've given it once, you don't need to give it again if you, if you had to. Um, I just want to touch on something else, which is which is an inherent problem of all the gene editing systems we've discussed so far, and this is the fact that you have to introduce a double strand break. Um, your cell really doesn't like double strand breaks, and that's why it has all these repair mechanisms to um, uh, to fix them. But these repair mechanisms aren't completely perfect, and any free chromosome chromosome ends can end up fusing somewhere they shouldn't. Um, you can get exceptionally large deletions in some cases, really disrupting a lot of the chromosome. You get odd chromosomal inversions. There's a lot of things that can go wrong if, you, if you're introducing double strand breaks. So people are really trying to investigate ways of moving CRISPR beyond being able to generate double strand breaks to do gene editing. I'll touch on those shortly. Um, you can imagine this is especially a problem if you're trying to do multiplex gene editing. So you're trying to delete multiple genes in the target cell. So this is a, a figure from a paper where we would be trying to, um, to modify three different sites in a T cell. So they're knocking out MHC class one expression through P2M. This makes the T cell um, unrecognizable by the, the, the patient's T cells, so they can't kill it. Um, it's knocking out PDCD1, which is um, the receptor that recognizes the protein PDL1. So it makes, uh, it makes your T cells immune to checkpoint inhibition. And yeah, these, these authors were also trying to knock out um, the TCR locus. So this prevents the donor T cells from going on and attacking the patient. And uh, these are three things that you really want to have if you're having an off the shelf called T cell therapy. Um, you can imagine this is that if you're generating a lot of free chromosome ends, you can end up with a range of uh, different translocations, again, because non-homologous end joining isn't perfect and it just sort of glues together any free chromosome ends around. So you can end up with some really, um, really deleterious uh, chromosomal translocations um, at relatively high frequency, all around 1%, but they're still at risk. Um, so how are people trying to get around that? And um, one way of doing this is by looking at the Cas9 enzyme itself and modifying it. So you can, people have started to think about CRISPR-Cas9 now as a, as a gene homing vehicle, rather than just as a double strand break inducer. And this is really now moving beyond classical gene editing. So as I mentioned at the start, um, your, your Cas9 enzyme has two nucleosomes, has two sites that cut each strand of your double strand of DNA. People have now engineered mutants of Cas9 that feature no nuclease activity. So these ones are able to bind sites specifically in the DNA, but they don't cut. Um, and people are doing really exciting things here to, to fuse these, these dead Cas9s um, to epigenome modifiers to alter the epigenome at site specific locations. Um, I think it's also really interesting is people are playing with the single, uh, making mutants of single domains of these, these, uh, these um, DNA cutting sites to generate Cas9 nicase enzymes. And what Cas9 nicase enzymes enable to, you to do is to trigger alternate DNA repair pathways that can substitute in and swap particular nucleotides in the SBAC cut site. And these have enabled approaches such as base editing and prime editing, which I'll come on to in a second. Both approaches that don't generate double strand breaks and therefore 
rid you of any risk of, of, um, of DNA translocations. Base editing works through generating a NIC and then having an enzyme which does uh, a chemical modification to, nu uh, to nucleotides to change them. So, for instance, so cytidine deaminized base editor, and this is in the case Cas9 is attached to. So, this is a big fusion protein, and it can convert a CG nucleotide to a TA. Um, so, this is particularly interesting if you're trying to treat patients with um, single base pair mutations in their genome. You don't need to do a full double strand break or introduce a homologous recombination template. You can directly modify the genome. Um, prime editing is slightly more complex. It involves the fusion of a Cas9 nickase to a reverse transcriptase and a modified guide RNA now that has a template which features whatever gene or whatever DNA you want to insert into the patient's genome. So now you have your guide, which brings Cas9 to the right place in the genome you want to introduce a small sequence to. When it binds, the reverse transcriptase, and this is the same one that's present in, very similar to one's present in the HIV virus, um, transcribes from the guide RNA template and introduces whatever DNA you want to introduce. So this way you can do site-specific modifications and insertions of DNA up to about 50 nucleotides in length without having to generate the double strand break, which is really powerful. Um, using the dead Cas9 enzyme, um, people are fusing these dead Cas9 enzymes to um, epigenetic modifying enzymes. So these are things that can bind to histones and alter histone marks. For instance, finding dead Cas9 to P300 in the context of the guide RNA um, brings your Cas9 and P300 wherever in the genome you want to increase gene expression. So you can switch on expression of particular genes. You can also imagine fusing these to histone rep repressors, which can deposit uh, repressive marks such as histone, uh, histone methylation marks or even DNA methylation marks. So you can fuse dead Cas9 to uh, DNA methyl transferases and deposits uh, methyl groups on DNA directly, shutting off that transcription. Again, another way of very, in a sort of very long-term manner, switching off expression of particular genes without having to worry about double strand breaks. Um, now I'm going to move to the clinic and the sort of final, final moments of time. Um, I really want to give you an overview of the technology and where it is in the, the research stage, but everything, I'm excited to tell you, everything we've spoken about so far is progressing in the clinic. And now these 31 CRISPR clinical trials that I mentioned are ongoing in oncology for various leukemias, lymphomas, renal cell carcinoma, solid tumors. Um, there's the sickle cell disease and beta cell programs from CRISPR therapeutics, which are probably nearing approval this year. Ophthalmology, uh, metabolic disease, so the mucopolysaccharidosis disease, and type 1 diabetes. There's monogenic conditions, so um, hereditary, hereditary angioedema and TTR amyloidosis, as well as familial hypercholesterolemia. And people are even using CRISPR to treat infectious disease. Um, so, I'm going to take you now through some of the um, some of the upcoming clinical programs. So first off, and this is the most advanced one, is the treatment of sickle cell disease. So this is a autologous therapy where uh, a patient's own sickle hematopoietic stem cells are extracted, gene edited outside the patient, and then given back to the patient in the form of bone marrow transplants. And currently. Over 50 patients have been treated, and so far, I think, but one are completely transfusion independent, truly revolutionizing the treatment of sickle cell disease and treated thalassemia. Um, TTR amyloidosis is another uh, disease, actually, that we, we went through in the, in the previous, uh, previous talk, um, which is currently treated through a synthetic, a, a small interfering RNA, uh, a drug called Odpatra from Al Nylon. However, um, there's now a more permanent approach that's coming through in, in the clinic, which is to knock out the TTR gene um, using CRISPR. Now, this is a lipid nanoparticle that features a CRISPR mRNA and a TTR gene-specific guide RNA. When this LNP enters the liver and hepatocytes within the liver, um, the 
Cas9 mRNA is trans, uh, translated into protein, into the Cas9 protein. It binds to the TTR-specific um, guide RNA, cuts the TTR locus, non-homologous end joining occurs, and this disrupts the TTR gene, decreasing its expression and really treating these patients. Um, so patients who had this, as you can see in panel B on this figure, um, have seen almost up to uh, 80 to 90% reduction in the serum concentration of TTR. Um, and this is really revolutionary because this is a once and done treatment. The patients don't have to return for a follow up and they never need to take the drug again. Um, in the final uh, minute of this talk now, I think I'll just move on to thinking about some, some ethical considerations. Um, so I want to talk about the economics of these once and done therapies. Um, so any novel therapy usually commands a really high price tag. It's usually sort of a summation of the fact that uh, R&D, most drugs fail, and the one that works has to pay off for all the programs that didn't work. Um, but when you have a once and done therapy, the economics become even more uh, even more scary or we'll have a really high sticker price. So um, for instance, some of these once and done therapies, people talk about prices of, in the region of two to five million dollars. Uh, um, you can put this in the context of the lifetime cost of a sickle cell patient in the US, right here around that two million dollars. So, argue potentially that they're worth the money, um, just at sticker value. But really, people are trying to come up with innovative models of paying these treatments. So, some companies are thinking of spreading these payments over a number of years, with um, any payment of subsequent installments dependent on the therapy fulfilling that promise of actually being a once and done therapeutic. Um, and cost issues are really a real problem to access. For instance, a company called Bluebird Bio has an approved beta valve treatment, but it's not being commercialized in Europe because they couldn't find anyone to pay for it, which is a real shame. Um, so some e e ethical considerations here, just that you have to think about the fact that many monogenic diseases are often prevalent in, in areas with poor access to healthcare. Um, so ex vivo therapeutics can be very difficult to deliver, and it's really there's a big push to get LP and in vivo therapeutics made, for instance, to treat sickle cell, um, so that they can reach patients who need them most. I think one I've been thinking about a bit is that um, in once in done therapies, it may be impossible to upgrade your treatment. So how good is good enough? If you have an AAD therapeutic, um, it will often make the subsequent dose less effective because you've generated antibodies to that, that viral vector. Um, you want to be sure that the treatment you're getting is the best possible treatment, which you have to put balance against, I guess, as a, as a patient against the fact that how, how rapidly you need that treatment. You can't just keep waiting for the next model of therapy like you would with an iPhone. Um, in addition, you're not going to get repeat bone marrow transplants um, uh, with novel therapeutics. People advance uh, the treatment of various um, mastic stem cell diseases. So they're really I think there's something that needs to go into how often you can get these therapies. And finally, just to touch on the ethical issues of, of, of germline modification and something you might have seen in the news. Um, so, Yi Jiangku, um, an individual in, in, in China who, who sort of under the radar um, performed a CRISPR deletion of CCR5. As you might know, CCR5 is the co receptor for HIV infection, and he did this in IVF embryos of patients where one of the parents um, was HIV positive. Uh, he was fined uh, three million yuan and sentenced to years in prison, but he's actually recently been released and actually, unfortunately, has been given the lab to start open. Germline modification in general is fraught with ethical issues for obvious reasons to uh, define the babies or what can we modify. Um, in the case of CCR5 deletion, um, really unethical because the safety is unknown and the risk of transmission to children if parents are HIV positive is, is truly minimal. And in this case, it wasn't even the mother that was HIV positive, it was the father. So really minimal risk of transfer during, uh, during birth and really does not fill the do no harm criteria. And after this event, a group of worldwide experts in CRISPR genome editing uh, published a sort of moratorium um, called calling for a moratorium on gene editing in uh, for general. With that, I'd like to end the talk. Thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, James, for that talk. Extremely thorough, as always, um, going through all the sort of modern uses of CRISPR right up to the 
I guess, the bleeding edge. So I've got a couple of questions to get us started. And if anyone does have any more, please feel free to post them in the chat and we'll filter them as needed. So the first question for you, James, is as follows. So one problem that we can foresee with sort of a CRISPR-Cas9 system is off-target effects, because there are certain areas of the genome that have a degree of complementarity or a degree of sort of repetition, especially high repeat regions. What sort of techniques do we use apart from just, you know, making longer, more complementary sequences to target these um, and to work around this problem? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So um, targeting the repetitive regions, I think, is, is, is going to be difficult for, for a long time. I don't think there's a way to get CRISPR to work on regions that are truly repetitive. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a company called eGenesis is actually targeting repetitive regions in, in pig genomes to delete endogenous retroviruses in pigs, and they bet CRISPR and will go after and cut 65,000 sites in the genome. Um, so it's very difficult to get site specific if you have repeats. I mean, one approach is that people have made FOC1 versions of the CRISPR Cas9 enzyme. And this is the end would sort of double your specificity. So you'd have 40 nucleotide specificity instead of 20 nucleotide specificity. Um, going beyond that, if the sequence is repetitive, I think it's even you would have a hard time figuring out the right one unless you could look at figure out exactly what chromosome it was on. Mm. But instead of doing through genome sequence, you won't be able to. Yeah, as I thought, it's I mean it's going to be a massive problem going forward, but certainly there's a lot of uses of CRISPR anyway. OK, my next question to you is one that I think has quite a lot of clinical implications. Polymorphism. So polymorphism will alter the binding site, right? So it can potentially not create an off target effect. It just creates a no target effect. Yes. Is there a thought of having sort of, I guess, um, multi avid CRISPR Cas9 systems all around the same area to target? Um, a specific gene. Yeah, so also a good question. Actually, that that online um, that online uh, tool I showed uh, always highlights if there's a single nucleotide polymorphism present in your guide sequence, so you can try and avoid them. Um, I think making making it avid is uh, multi avid is is difficult because usually then you'd be decreasing the specificity to your enzyme and then you get your off targets which you want to avoid. Um, I think the key is that if you're trying to um, if you're trying to make a knockout your gene, you actually have quite a wide expanse of, of genome to target, and you can find regions that don't feature uh, single nucleotide variants and target those. Um, in in the clinic, if you're doing if you're creating a clinical product, give you an idea. These guide RNAs at high quality level uh, cost uh, cost in the region of billions to manufacture. Mm -hmm. So if you had to make manufacture multiple copies. From a cost of goods perspective, your therapeutic it's uh, it's it's very expensive. Um, so usually try to find make one, pick a really good one, and and move forward with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so another question. So you mentioned a couple of delivery systems, so such as LNPs, and but all of them, I guess, share a somewhat of a common problem and that is immunogenicity as you've highlighted already. Now immunogenicity if you have a the patient's own endogenous system that's then sort of cell that's been modified is probably reduced but there are there are any other ways of reducing immunogenicity that people are working on? So um, so LNPs themselves they don't feature protein components um, they're inflammatory but they're not necessarily um, immunogenic. I'd say their main, their main issue is they, they at the moment, all go to the liver, um, which yeah. is an issue. Um, and we personally are working on a non-immunogenic delivery vehicle example, which we decided to talk about at some point. Um, but you might have seen in the news recently, people are actually trying to, um, to uh, turn endogenous retroviruses into delivery vehicles. So your genome is full of viruses. In principle, um, those those viruses uh, uh, those viruses are non-immunogenic because you can tolerate them. And so people are trying to harness endogenous viruses to make delivery vehicles that are non-immunogenic. Um, 
there was a big news story yesterday or the day before about it, they called a real therapeutics that just launched with a very large family brand to, mm -hmm. to do just that. Um, so that's one potential route. There's also exosomes. So exosomes are small micro vesicles um, derived from our cells, which are human, uh, and those are also um, critically non mutagenic. Thank you. And another question, and I think I already know the answer to this from our talks previously, but I think this is for the wider cohort. Um, when you have, as you mentioned, it's difficult to get high yield in CRISPR, really difficult, and that's with one or two sort of CRISPR modifications. But there are times where multiple modifications are needed to the same cell for multiple reasons you may have have a sort of tumor that needs multi sort of target sort of um, combating to combat it. Yeah. How does one increase the um, sort of transduction, one might say, of CRISPR-Cas9, the fidelity of it? Yeah, um, so I'm going to take this as sort of a multiplex. How do you get yeah. high enough to do multiplex yeah. in question? And um, I think one one really nice uh, one really nice example that came out recently. I had a slide on it, but just didn't, didn't have time to show. It was on um, was engineering T cells to target uh, uh, T cell leukemias, and that was done at Gosh with at the UCL. Um, it, it was in the news as well. And these these authors um, deleted a gene on the T cell um, that uh, is present on normal T cells, so they could target their T cells with a chimeric antigen receptor to, 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 kill, t to kill endogenous T cells. Um, if you don't do that, then your car is going to target yourself, so you end up with something called fratricide, you, you target yourself. Uh, they also deleted um, NEC class 1 expression and endogenous TCR expression, as well as a gene called CD52, which is a target for an antibody commonly used to treat TAR. Um, and they used base editors. Um, so, because they used base editors, they didn't have to worry about the translocation effect uh, because it only, it only creates a single strand thing. Um, and this is why they were able to do that. And with very high efficiencies, these enzymes now are really you know, pushing up to 80, 90% efficiency. So if you multiply that through, you still have to with these sort of 60 to 70% of your cells featuring all the knockouts you wanted to include. With stem cells, it's a bit of a different story because you have longer time to culture them. You can do your edits sequentially. So you can do a cut, wait, cut gets corrected uh, or, or disrupted. And then you can do another batch of CRISPR onto those cells and already feature uh, the original knockout. And with that approach, honestly, for each knockout, most guys, you can get 95 to 100% knockout efficiency in your pool um, with, with uh, modern approaches. Perfect. Well, thank you very much again, Dr. James Patterson. Um, as always, it's been a pleasure to have you um, talk to us for the second time for our Linkage webinar series. These will be monthly talks. So I'm pleased to announce the next one is going to be about um, SMA particularly SMA type 1, so that is spinal muscular atrophy, and the exciting gene therapy nucinesin that is used in it, and that is going to be delivered by a paediatric neurology consultant from Great Ormond Street, Dr. Louise Hartley. Thank you very much again, James, um, and if you would all be so kind as to fill in our feedback, it's really helpful for us to sort of design the series and make any alterations as needed going forward. And we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much.